This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to the July edition of One Month to a Better Compliance Program. This month, we're going to focus on One Month to Better Internal Controls. This month's sponsor is Workiva, and first, I'd like to have a word from our sponsor. Thanks, Tom. Workiva delivers a modern internal control solution that connects risk and internal control information across the enterprise. The WS Cloud Platform is collaborative, powerful, and intuitive, and optimizes documentation, testing, approval, and reporting processes. The platform is proven to increase productivity and drive better decision-making and is used by more than 2,800 organizations worldwide for financial reporting and ICFR processes. To learn more, visit www.workiva.com. Over the next month, I'm going to explore several topics related to internal controls. We're going to take a look at what internal controls are and how they relate to a best practices compliance program. I'm going to help you understand how to design an internal controls regime for compliance, and then some of the specific internal controls for the functional disciplines within a corporate compliance program. We're going to take a look at the COSO 2013 framework around internal controls and explain how that integrates into your best practices compliance program. I think it'll be a fascinating uh, month for you. We'll certainly uh, explore the area of internal controls in depth. This podcast, One Month to a Better Compliance Program, is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Day 16, COSO's Objectives and Principles, Risk Assessments. The integrated framework recognizes that every entity faces a variety of risks from internal and external sources. This objective is designed to provide a company with the dynamic iteration process for identifying and assessing risks. For the compliance practitioner, none of this will sound new or even insightful. However, the COSO framework requires a component of management input and oversight that perhaps is not well understood. The framework volume says management specifies objectives within the category relating to operations reporting and compliance with such clarity, be able to identify and analyze risk to those objectives. But management's role continues throughout this process as it must consider both internal and external changes which can affect or change risk and may render internal controls ineffective. The final requirement is also important for both an anti-corruption compliance uh, internal control. Changes are coming quite quickly in the realm of anti-corruption laws and their enforcement. Management needs to be cognizant of these changes and changes that its business model may make in the delivery of goods or services, which could increase the risk of running afoul of these laws. So today's objective is control environment. Today's objective is risk assessments. The objective of risk assessment consists of four principles. Principle six, suitable objectives. Your risk assessment should relate to the stated objectives. As noted in the framework volume, it is management who is responsible for setting the objectives. Too often, an organization starts with a list of risks instead of considering what objectives are threatened by your risk, and then the control activities or other actions it needs to take. In other words, your objectives should form the basis on which your risk assessments are approached. Principle seven. Identify and analyze risk. Risk risk identification should be an ongoing process. While it should begin at senior management, even though a risk assessment assessment may originate at the top of an organization or even a functioning unit, the key is that the overall process exists to determine how risks are identified and managed across the entity. You need to avoid siloed risks at all costs. Risk identification must be comprehensive. Principle eight, fraud risk. Every compliance practitioner should understand that fraud exists in every organization. Moreover, the monies that must be generated to pay bribes can come from what may be characterized as traditional fraud schemes, such as employee expense accounts, fraud, fraudulent third-party contracting and payments, and even fraudulent overcharging and pocketing of the differences in sales price. This means that it should be considered an important risk analysis. It is important that any company follow the flow of money, and if the fraud triangle is present, management should be placed around such risk. Principle nine, identify and analyze significant change. 
It is really true that if there is one constant theme in business, it is that there will always be change. Every entity will require a process to identify and assess those internal and external factors that significantly affect its ability to achieve its objectives. Uh, Companies should have a formal process to identify significant changes, both internal and external, and assess the risk and approaches to mitigate the risks in a timely manner. The SEC has made clear that companies should be expanding their view of risk in implementing the COSO 2013 framework. Obviously, risk assessments are a cornerstone of best practices. Compliance program is laid out in the 2012 FCPA guidance and the Department of Justice's evaluation of corporate compliance programs issued in February 2017. Regulators are telling companies specifically that they should be seeing new risks and that they should address the risk because of the changes brought about by this new standard. In the area of internal control, fraud risk is particularly something that has been of keen interest because of the opportunity to mask fraud through the judgments made in recognizing revenue, no matter what the revenue recognition standard. However, other risks companies uh, should consider in their risk uh, assessment include that a company's business practices do not relate to the accounting that they are providing because the business practices are changing and internally the company is not recognizing the business practice change. So you've got to look at how you do business practices even if you think you have a contractual relationship. Another example is that sales personnel are given cons- giving concessions to customers that are not often reflected in the understanding of the contract and the accounting for that contract. Another activity might be to acquire contracts that aren't being properly accounted for or even recognized at some level. The concessions that are being given are backed at the back end for return and are not being reported back into the process affects the estimate of cheap revenue going forward. Finally, risks that a company has misstated or understated uh, require determination if revenue should be recognized over a period of time or estimated what period of time uh, you would use on a rolling time frame going forward. For example, a period of time could be longer than uh, your revenue is recognized or it could be shorter. There are always risks that revenue will be recognized too early and that costs will be pushed out and spread over too long a period of time. As we begin to think about these new judgments that are required, you get into entirely new level of judgment and risk related to um, the judgment that companies need to identify both to build both preventative and detect controls. Have a plan to respond if you discover that the risk has actually happened and that there's a control failure. So what are today's three key takeaways? Well, let's start with number one, risk assessment. In every compliance panoply, program, description, guidance, interpretation, anything I can think of and that probably you can think of, risk assessments are a key element. Under the uh, 2012 guidance, under the ISO standard, under the six principles of an adequate compliance program under the UK Bribery Act, under the Brazilian Cleans Companies Act, even under the New Mexican anti-corruption law, risk assessments are required. So this is, should be nothing new to you. Uh, what you need to do, though, is think about risk from the internal control perspective. Do you have controls in place to both prevent and detect uh, for your business practices and the business practices that are on the ground? So that leads to number two, which is to look at risk across your organization and not in a siloed manner. If your business practices in one area differ uh, from another area, you have to take that into account in your internal controls to make sure there's no internal controls failure. And finally, number three, the determination of risk and the management of changes over time uh, should be, you should be cognizant of the business practices on the ground. I can't emphasize this last point enough, as you have to make sure that the way your contracts are being guided in the field is actually how the work's being done. If people are, if products or services are delivered in a time frame or a time manner different than the contract specifies, it needs to be reflected in your internal controls because this is certainly a risk. It can be a risk for your revenue recognition and your overall financial statement, but it can also be a compliance risk. I hope you have enjoyed day 16 of one month 
to more effective internal controls, and I hope you'll join me tomorrow for Day 17. This is Tom Fox again. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of One Month to Better Internal Controls. If you've listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate this podcast as it would help in our rankings. Get the word out about the only one month podcast series, which enables you to design, implement, and enhance a better compliance program. Also, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you'll join us again tomorrow.